Okay, on Lifestyle Medicine today, we have got Kelly Lake, who is a friend and colleague. We were both five branchers, uh, university in Santa Cruz, California for Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And welcome, man. Thank you for, uh, thank you for thank being you. here. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I, I love your podcast and everything. So it's really cool to be on here and actually have a conversation with you <laughs> rather than just comment how cool <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, man. I'm glad to have you on here. Yeah. Um, so, you know what, just, just as a kind of frame of reference, I know we were in school at the same time. I graduated in 2013. When did you leave Five Branches? I graduated in uh, 2015. 2015, 2015. okay. So yeah, so couple, December 2015 years. was my graduation. Yeah, two years. Yeah. Okay, very cool. And did you, you know, some people, when they come out, um, they end up becoming, quote unquote, licensed acupuncturists. And some people kind of just go into, you know, the, the larger Chinese <laughs> medicine field like myself. Um, what did you end up becoming a licensed acupuncturist? And take, I did. Okay, very did. cool. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I did. I, I, I didn't pass the first time. Yeah. Many don't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what? It was interesting about that. It wasn't so much on terms of uh, knowledge. It was more terms of st uh, test taking strategy, and, For sure. uh, you know, that type of thing. So I actually studied less the second time and focused more on test taking method. And uh, that was hugely helpful. Well, like, that's, that's good to hear. And I should talk to you after the fact, because I think that was definitely my issue too. When I was taking the test, I could real I realized, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty quickly. I was like, this isn't about, I like, I know the information's in there, but yeah, getting it out and understanding how to do it, man. It's a tricky game for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's all the sorts of things, mental fatigue and all yep. sorts of things. Yeah. It's very real. So Kelly, why don't you um, give the listeners kind of an overview um, just to what you're doing in the Chinese medical field and a little bit of your background, because you and I have some similar interests and similar mm -hmm. threads, but mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear, you know, just kind of your, your overlay onto the Chinese medicine scene and what you're doing with it. Yeah. Ult ultimately, when you're doing uh, any sort of Chinese medicine or any any service in general, you want to make sure that you're doing what you love, because what you love is actually going to be what you're most successful at. You know, if I'm not really fully engaged and infatuated with my experience, it's going to I'm just going to be kind of fatigued throughout the day, you know, yep. this type of thing. So a lot of a lot of what our society runs into. So I make sure when I, anytime I take a client that I take a client that uh, I feel good with. Now, the Chinese medicine is not my primary thing. It's not like my primary work. It's not my primary income. Mm -hmm. It's actually something I do more as a side uh, thing. And mm -hmm. I, if I take a client, it's because I feel like I could really work with that client. And so my specialty is first and foremost with the medical Qigong therapy that I, I did with uh, Professor Jerry Allen Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes I actually don't even use acupuncture needles. Uh, and um, yeah, so if I take a client, usually for myself, what gets me most excited is uh, helping people with like their uh, uh, navigating life, is getting them empowered, uh, getting getting uh, them back into a place where circumstance isn't the dominant force in their life, where they're actually sourcing and creating their experience. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing that really infatuates me is to be able to like help people find those pivots within themselves and then c come in touch with their values and their resources and then begin to utilize their current experience to produce the the content of their life. So that's that's my biggest thing is helping people overcome obstacles and attend to kind of, uh, uh, you know, heal, heal themselves uh, in terms of a, a spiritual navigation type of thing. And uh, the pain second, you know, I really like working with pain. And first, you know, I'm very much a hands-on guy. So uh, acupuncture needles are nice. But again, it's not my like forte. It's not my passion. Yeah. So as I'm not completely in love with the, the needling part, mm -hmm. I don't really do it. Uh, so I really focus more on like the Qigong and the Tui Na. And uh, I really like that stuff. So I've had some fun with that. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting about what you're saying is, and this is, I think it's, it's not as pitched as heavily. I think when we're in school, they don't talk to us about it as much. It's sort of like, this is how mm. Chinese medicine done is, is acupuncture and herbs. But there are so many people that um, get out of Chinese medicine and end up relying on Twina more, or they mm. become just, just focused on herbalism, you know, and really seeing right. result with that. And I think that's the interesting part for me in seeing how um, Chinese medicine is so dynamic and the way people can plug into it. So like, mm -hmm. like you're saying, you kind of find your aptitude or your strength within the spectrum 
you use that as your front running tool, the thing that, that, that you're stoked mm -hmm. on. And that's what I really liked about Chinese medicine. Once I was, I understood that, that there were lots of places to plug in and you got to lead with the one that you're, um, the tools that like fit the best. And it sounds like that's what you're doing, which is pretty great. Right. Cool. Yeah. And you're not alone. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of practitioners who I talk to is very similar threads where they're doing different things than just acupuncture. They don't yeah, fully align. Definitely. Some people are just like full on herbs, you know, yeah, and that type are. of thing. So, yep. uh, yeah. <laughs> very cool, man. Well, let's talk about, um, you know, let's talk about your martial arts background a little oh, bit, right. but, yeah. because I know you love that and I love martial arts yeah. and that kind of stuff as well. And I know, um, I believe the common ground, at least between the two of us, that we you are a pretty like devout Bagua guy, if I remember correctly. Like you're yeah, Bagua uh, tends to be the forte in any type of movement skill, or I tend to kind of pour into Bagua in some sort of way. Yeah, yeah. very cool. And um, you know, I've studied Bagua, and it hasn't been my forte as much. Tai Chi has been more of mine, but um, Xingyi, you know, I lean more towards. Um, I remember that. Yeah, yeah I love Xingyi, <laughs> and um, but I love Bagua too. It was just you know, life kind of takes you down the road where it was like, I was getting more shingy exposure. So it just kind of stuck. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about your Bagua. Let's talk about how you found it. Um, and just kind of giving the audience an orientation <laughs> to Bagua because it's sort of, in a sense, sort of an esoteric martial arts by the mainstream standards. People usually don't know yeah. what, it, what it means or what it is or how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. So it, it gets that kind of, uh, goes towards my story and how I even got into it and that sort of thing. Sure. So, uh, you know, as a, as a kid, we'll start there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back to the youth. <laughs> yeah. Back to youth. Um, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a, as a kid, you know, I've always kind of had some sort of calling or co a connection to some sort of like Eastern philosophy, you know, it's like anytime there was any sort of like warriorship and especially more East, uh, warriorship that had to do with any like sort of Eastern philosophy or something like that, that always had like a, a calling or uh, a resonance with me. And uh, I didn't, I, I tried uh, jujitsu uh, here and there in my childhood. And my brother got into it a lot more uh, on going. He took that school very seriously. I kind of touched and go like it wasn't really my thing. Like there wasn't a match there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't until I got out of high school and uh, I finished with my growth spurts. And so now I'm getting much more dexterous with my body. I wasn't very you know athletic when I was in high school and everything. And now mm -hmm. I'm very athletic. Mm -hmm. And that may have been part of the reason why I wasn't so uh, called to the martial arts at that time, even though I was trying. Uh, but it was uh, right after uh, high school and uh, I was going to community college and uh, I saw this, uh, this Chinese martial arts uh, studio on the, on the way home. And uh, I stopped in and I, I just signed up. And I, ever since that for whole first year, I was there about six to eight hours a day. Uh, I was just there as much as, as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went, uh, you know, if at the school, I, 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 I ended up, uh, at least at that school, I don't know as a whole, but I ended up uh, progressing faster than uh, uh, the other students there. So I, I, I surpassed a lot of people in their belt ranks and that type of thing. And um so i ended up with like a brown belt i was like working for my black belt and i i the audio cut from for a minute at, oh. least, at least on my end what was the oh. what, what was the style you were studying the first one? Oh, it was a it was it was like a seven animal system it was a style called like shoshu uh, -huh. uh it's it more uh there's a guy named almore senior and now his the head of the school is almore jr uh you know a really cool guy really talented guy and um so uh, I did, I, but it was like a big school. So I actually trained with someone else, and uh, let's see. So Almore Senior, he he was very much a Kenpo specialist. But I, mm -hmm. in some trips to China, uh, I, I might be fuzzy on the details because it's been a while. But I, I remember his trips to China and things like that, or uh, connections with different Chinese martial artists. He who really liked the animal systems and the things that he was learning over there. But he liked the way that the Kempo, the American Kempo thing was like set up or Chinese Kempo thing was set up. So yep. he thought that was an easier way for people to learn mm -hmm. and for people to practice and remember things. So he kind of blended the two and created his own thing uh, called Shoshu, uh, mm -hmm. to my understanding. And I might have the details fuzzy, so don't exactly quote me on that. Sure. But from there, uh, you know, I, I started... Uh, uh, I started doing Tai Chi at the community college and I figured, well, you know, like I needed an elective and I 
they figured that was something movement based. And so I was basically trying to do everything movement based because I was totally in love with martial arts at this point. Yeah. And I thought Tai Chi was kind of foo foo stuff, you know. So <laughs> I, I was like, ah, whatever. Yeah. And actually, someone else got me to uh, do it. They're like, you want to do Tai Chi with me? I'm like, fine. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, I'll go. Stuff. I'll check this out. Right. And, and the whole, the whole, the whole, like, you know, mentality of like the show shoe thing is like, we're a street fighting martial art, like this type of stuff. It was like one of those, like, yeah. we don't wear whiteies, we wear blackies. Like, <laughs> right. this type of thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. The badass and, uh, badge. Right. The yeah. Badass. Yeah. And I loved that. I was like, what, an 18 year old kid and everything. It was just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, I was doing the Tai Chi thing and some guy was showing me how to uh, open the joints and I started feeling energy pulsing between my palms and it was like going left and right it was like a very strong pulse and uh, I was like I never felt like anything like this you know not to my re remembrance and so I was looking for someone who can answer my questions and I was googling like Tai Chi master Monterey like this type of thing sure. I discovered uh, Jerry Allen Johnson and uh he, uh, he wasn't teaching Tai Chi, he was teaching medical Qigong therapy, and I didn't know what Qigong was, and I Googled it, and it looked interesting enough, and I figured I'd sign up and just give it a go. And uh, everyone was bad-mouthing him. I guess some people had some bad run-ins with him or mm. didn't like what he was teaching or just had opinions about him. And uh, you know what? Like I was just like, you know what? Like I already paid the down payment for the class. Like I'm going to just give it a go. Like you can see sure. what it's like for myself. I'll have my own experience. Yeah. So I go and I loved it. And from the medical qigong, uh, I started. Uh, I hooked up with one of uh, Sifu Johnson's uh, senior students at the time before he uh, uh, got kicked out. And uh, he he uh, I started doing bagua with him. And so I was doing bagua with him, and he was like a. a uh, a Vietnam vet and, you know, had a, cr a crazy past, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I don't, I don't know if they're, they're not really my stories to share, but they're pretty insane. Yeah. And, uh, so he was a pretty, you know, full on guy. And, mm -hmm. uh, he 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 would just like he enjoys you know his like his the crowd that he wants to be surrounded by or like people that like do like night drops and like you know gun ranges and like crazy missions just for fun right. you know what I mean right so uh, he anyway so I turned with him and uh, it was re really good and uh, we had a really nice connection and. You know, he gave me a concussion or two or something. <laughs> it's like that type of thing. He was a little bit more full on. It's like, yeah. So it's like, you know, things, the things that I also realized that weren't necessary and weren't like the kindest things to do, you know, that type of thing. Like, all I did was ask a question. It's not like we were even sparring. Like, right. I just asked a question and he demonstrated it on my head. Like, right. <laughs> it's so, a very old school martial arts style. Yeah. It's, so, yeah. and yeah, that's just how he kind of came from uh, the, the way he came from. And so after after there was a falling out with him and Sifu Johnson, Sifu Johnson decided that he would teach the the Bhagwan Tai Chi since people uh, basically had to kind of decide between him and Sifu Johnson. Right. So I started going with Sifu Johnson, and I, I was doing the Tai Chi, the the Bagua, uh, the Taoist mysticism, the medical Qigong, going the five branches, like uh, uh, a center of integrative Chinese medicine I was kind of doing that thing as a medical Qigong therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the community college, I was like kind of full on at that time in my life. Yep. And um, then, uh, yeah, and then from there, I just really, just really took to the Bagua and just practiced a lot. And uh, and then eventually uh, became an inner door student and started doing the Nagong training. And then eventually, you know, three years later from Nagong training, uh, 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 the, we uh, uh, made Sifu and that sort of thing. And that's been good. And then my uh, Bagua has just been developing from there uh, in terms of exploring different movement and, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, just kind of absorbing everything as much as possible. And, and one of my uh, best friends is uh, uh, Sifu Harinder uh, Singh mm -hmm. at Sabrawal. You know, might yes. know him or something. Yeah, I've seen him. I, f I follow him on social media and I, I love just seeing his... Fi oh. fiery intensity yeah he's the best yeah. <laughs> sometimes I, I tease him and i'm like you know how like there's five elements in he's the like one the, yeah i'm just like <laughs> you're one you're all fire like, you're all fire teasing him because yeah. uh he's hilarious like it just you know i always did kind of tease him on that and like we'll be doing something little you know and he'll be like so like <sighs> like focused <laughs> it's like it's right. So funny. right uh i love it i love that guy 
but uh, we we hooked up and we started training because he trained with uh, the same uh, lineage with Arnold Tayam doing Chen style. And Arnold Tayam was one of my uh, teachers, like first senior students, and that's uh-huh. like, and so he we we hooked up because we had a similar training and similar lineage, you know, that Jerry on Johnson lineage. So uh, we hooked up, and he's the JKD guy. And you know, as far as far as I'm concerned, the best JKD you could find out there. He's one putting in the most work. Uh, you know, two the most talented. Uh, three like embodies the philosophy of Bruce Lee the most. Like everyone's like, you know how politics are sure. tradition is. It's like oh, yeah. that's not the way Bruce Lee would do it or something like that. Type of thing. Right. It's like how many uh, how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb, or how many Tai Chi people does it take to screw in a light bulb? It's like one to screw in the light bulb, then like. 87 others to say oh it's not how my style will do it you know that type of thing that's I mean, it's <laughs> so. always the case and kind of an uphill battle I, th- I feel like with a lot of traditional martial arts like there's just yeah. that mentality is pervasive in the study of this stuff for sure like it's right <laughs> it's and very much there well that's the thing is tradition gets uh, it works as a pollutant in, in people's current experience uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the time and they don't actually they're they're putting themselves into a trance and they're putting yeah. themselves into an illusion and they're not, they're not taking into account reality yeah. uh, and this type of thing. Or they're just like, you know, some type of loyalty or something like that or pride yeah. and it doesn't serve them. There's no openness in that regard. So anyway, so with uh, Sifu uh, Harinder Singh, several, we just get together. We would train Nagong a lot for a while. I mean, he's so busy now and I'm so busy right now. But we used mm-hmm. to uh, wake up and train at 5 a.m. Uh, almost every uh, every day, at least three times a day or three times a week or four times a week or something. That's great. And, uh, you know, is with him, like my fighting skill really developed because we would just we'd wrestle, we'd box, you know, and then we do yep. Nagong and each one and push hands and box and wrestle. And like, you know, I'd come home, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, I'd have a black eye or something like that, you sure. know, or I'd like my back would have spasmed, like this type of thing. Yeah. And uh, so it really helped me like develop a, a lot of my fighting skill. And during that time, I also got a job at a boxing gym, and I was a boxing and kickboxing instructor at the boxing gym, and my scout, and uh, I taught classes there. And uh, basically, for those uh, three and a half hours, I was training. So it's like not like I would just run people through class. Most times, you know, if there's there's days where I was like kind of a little bit low energy. But sure. most days, I would be working out. I'd be doing the warm ups uh, three and a half uh, uh, times. I'd be hitting the bag. I'd just be working on technique, you know, things that I uh, bring in from Bagua. I'd be working that on the bag. The Ichuan is the main component of our art. So we I'd work the Ichuan and stuff and the discharge on the bags. And, uh, um, and then I'd work uh, wrestling on the bags. I'd work on shooting for the legs, uh, you know, that type of thing. It's like you see people do that. And um, uh, then I work on my boxing and kickboxing and stuff that uh, her, uh, Herinder would give me to, to work on. So I was just, just having a ball. It was just perfect environment for me. Yeah, very busy, yeah. and but lots yeah. of exposure. And I think that's it's great because I think if you're going to study – martial arts for the actual some people pursue it primarily as just a, as a form of exercise and health and then there's people that are also really studying it to learn yeah. fighting skill and if you're going to do that i feel like that cross training is pretty crucial if you're going oh, to be it's absolutely crucial yeah it's if you're going to be legitimate you gotta you gotta dabble in all of that stuff back oh, um backtracking yeah. just a little bit you know going back to kind of that original question about the bagua for people that are like not familiar with Bagua oh. and they have no frame of reference, yeah. how would you describe Bagua in a nutshell? Like I have my definition okay. and the way I think about it, but um, mm. for people that are just completely green and are, have no clue, how would mm-hmm. you describe Bagua and wh- what does it do? Uh, okay. It's uh, think uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question. I know. I'm trying to say <laughs> like, think of like really cool looking Tai Chi or something like that. You know, yeah. like Tai Chi, that's like very spinny or something like that. People might think Tai Chi's like, again, like how I thought it was, like mm-hmm. the foo-foo stuff. Sure. Uh, so what I can say is it's uh, it's an exploration on how to utilize your anatomy to demonstrate power with as little effort as possible and using what's intrinsically there without muscular tension. So intrinsic strength, meaning mm-hmm. the, it's already it's a type of strength and output that's happening regardless of how tense your muscles are right so yep. it's intrinsic and so if you look at the intrinsic quality of the tissue it's elastic compressive and like buoyant like this type of thing yep and so if we can utilize our anatomy to the the best uh it's, you know in, in terms of what we would be classified as an internal principle uh uh you know things working more on the inside than the outside um 
yeah, you're you're putting that type of essence and way of utilizing your body within a frame that has developed uh, as a type of style over time. So so what happens is oftentimes like you know with Bagua like uh, I have I have lots of opinions on Bagua. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Most people do it as an external martial art, and they'll call it an internal martial art. This type of thing. Yep. Uh, but it should embody all of the Nagong principles and the, the 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 qualities that are discovered in Tai Chi. You mm-hmm. know, like stick, adhere, join, and follow. Like Peng Lu Ji An. You know, uh, as a Sai Liu uh, Lie, mm-hmm. uh, Tao and Zhou. Uh, like those type of things, like the ape like uh, powers, and then things yep. like uh, uh, Ting Jin and. Uh, 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 Najin and uh, all that type of thing, all, all that type of thing. So uh, uh, all the all those types of abilities uh, should be present in Bagua. And if they're not, and it's not traditional for those things to be Bagua, well, then tradition should change. Uh, you know, it's, things should evolve. You know, there's no point in keeping things static because you see people that like receive a teaching and then like the the master dies, and then you see the teaching be something totally you know, different and not at the level of which the master was teaching. So what happens, people are trying to like, stick to tradition or would take information from one down to another. But have you ever played the telephone game? Like the information gets so, it goes through the filters that people have and it gets, uh, or misunderstood or they're talking about things they have yet to embody. So the the reference points are just all over the yeah. place, and the actual results are just not there. And so what you can trust is uh, your own intelligence uh, in terms of actual intelligence, just not being able to talk and be articulate, sure. but to actually explore possibilities and explore the unknown. So going into a place where you you test it and you get feedback and you go well that doesn't work with the western with the western martial arts these days it's like yeah. you know that type of stuff so mm-hmm. like one of the biggest problems with chinese martial arts is the lack of head movement yeah. uh and uh so you know if i have like a bagua online program and i teach a little bit of applications it's not the main focus but it's there sure but i always teach like how to uh, you know where the head is and then just making it very simple i mainly focus on the jab cross because that's yeah, such a, just the jab cross like you know it's such a problem for chinese martial artists you know if well, you most times if you get a guy that's you teach him jab cross and you teach him uh how to utilize it how to probe with the jab or how to strong arm and stiff arm with the jab and all this type of stuff and then line up the cross and then you know, if you can get them a really good jab cross, they're going to beat the Chinese martial artist that has like a bunch of forms and a bunch of sure. experience within those forms for like like nine out of ten times or ten out of ten times. And so, and the main thing is they just don't understand the the, the angle and the distancing and that sort of thing. Uh, but sorry, I keep on going off. I, I like this stuff, so I'll just ramble. <laughs> I know. No, there's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot here too. I know. Yeah, and uh, so the uh, yeah Bagua is a uh, is a very cool martial art. It uh, it's it has the inter- it works with internal principles and utilizing your anatomy in a specific the type of way. It really emphasizes footwork, and it emphasizes a, a, a type of coiling and like a, a a dynamic type of movement. And uh, it also uh, it works with the eight animal system. So it has the this type of eight animal system. It works with the trigrams and the hexagrams of the I Ching. Uh, you know, and so it has more of that esotericism part of it. There's like meditation and energetic work that goes along with it, yeah. at least as far as our school is concerned. Uh, other schools might not focus on that, but it's up to yeah. preference. Yeah, and that, you know, that was my first exposure to Bagua many years back. I'm 30, oh, really? I'm th- well, I'm, 30, I'm 38 now, just turned 38. And I was, okay. I think I was 20 or 21 maybe when I first was exposed to Bagua. And the first mm. time I was exposed was through... Bruce, Bruce Kumar Francis's method. Oh yeah, yeah. so Francis. yeah, so I I like found him. I read his book and then found out he was doing seminars in Menlo Park. And I remember one oh. of the, one of the things that this was years ago, it was many years ago. But oh. one of the things that drew me to it was this discourse where he was talking about um, you know essentially taking the the I Ching, which is like the Taoist Bible of sorts, you know, and right in a sense, yeah, yeah, and like in a sense, and and manifesting the eight 
you know, intrinsic energies found in the I Ching, you know, manifesting mm. them in the body, the circle walking, which I always found fascinating. And I loved the coiling action of Bagua. Mm. But one of the things that he brought up, which is what you just said, he said, you know, Bagua in China and in the West now is being practiced as an external martial art when there's all of these other layers where some traditions of Bagua were strictly monastic, where they were just about refining internal energy and really um, they had less martial application. It was more of like almost like an, a tool for enlightenment, you know, where he said right. they can really get deep into the practice. And he said, but if you're going to use it for martial arts, you do have to train it kind of externally and understand those principles because when you get into a real fight, yeah. it's very different than you trying to, um, you know, move the subtler things inside. Yeah. But I think that was really, I loved, I guess, the spectrum from which Bagua offered. And I think just internal martial yeah. arts in general, where these internal principles, um, depending on the person, where they're wanting to focus, right? If they're wanting to become a fighter, quote yeah. unquote, or they're really trying to explore this more internal, immaterial, you know, realm, I guess, is like, that was yeah. the piece that I really liked in, in hearing. And um, yeah, it's just kind of a cool progression to see how Bagua how different practitioners and different schools and systems approach Bagua because it is different. You know, there's definitely right. some different strokes. Yeah. And martial arts in general, like I, that's one thing I love about it is it serves everyone in the particular way that they're trying to get benefit from it. So yep. I, I am definitely not one of those people that's like angry and needs to <laughs> prove myself and yeah. like this type of stuff. Like I don't, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. If someone wants to claim they can beat me up, that's fine. I have really don't care, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, I have a, 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 no interest. Uh, it's like, but the thing is, like, you know, with martial arts, people can come forward and like get confidence out of it. Like they can increase the health of their body. You know, like, yep. uh, like there's so many things. They don't have to become a fighter, and like that's okay. Like that doesn't need to be part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but like of course, there's still going to be like partner practice and skill, but it helps course. you develop elements about yourself. You know, it's like yeah. developing that confidence and like coming into touch with that like that type of awareness and that the hitting the uh, you know like what the athletes call the zone. You know, like getting in the zone where like the yep. mind shuts off and your body's like acting at like a, a reacting to data at like a hyper rate you know like a really fast rate like normal than it, it would normally uh, they're going into a type of lucidity it's like you know they had to discover these things and really discover p things about them that they didn't uh and know that they could do and that's wonderful uh, but the fighting aspect is is not you know is not for everyone and particularly I'm like I'm not fighting you know like mm -hmm. I'm not entering competitions and this right. thing. it's right. a skill that I cultivate and like I find very fascinating and fun yeah. Uh, but I, I have no interest to try to like prove it to anyone. Like that's for me, you know, it's like, yeah. ultimately it's like, it's like any type of thing that you do, like it's for you, like mm -hmm. it's because you love it and it's nourishing you. So if I'm like exploring like uh, intrinsic and, you know, uh, quality of the tissues and how to apply it and, uh, apply the application of like energetics and Shen Gong and that type of thing. Yeah. It's because I find it fun and fascinating, and I'm simply exploring what my potential is, and uh, and then hopefully I'm doing it with someone who also finds those things fascinating. So we're both learning, and right. from that we're developing a type of internal framework that we actually use as a type of language for digesting our daily experience in our world. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a there's a book called The Art of Learning that I recently finished uh, by um, he was a Tai Chi and a uh, guy as well, and now he's a BJJ guy. Uh, oh god what was his name uh it's a very popular book but the art of learning mm -hmm. and he very much talks about like this internal framework thing and i was like ah oh, it's exactly you know what i've been trying to uh to express to a lot of students for a long time it's like you're learning is like him as a chess master when he was younger like right. all those that internal framework that you develop like shows up in your other other areas in your life so same thing for me it's like i'll use bagua and martial arts in general to really a lot to like really give context to and like a uh, language to something that i'm trying to digest you know so even when i'm teaching like spiritual stuff you know i'm just like yeah. it's like a jab cross <laughs> like, you know? yeah so, you yeah know? <laughs> apply it apply so, it to the the physical yeah. frame i think you know you hit on a <clears throat> you hit on a really good point which is i the last episode i did um or a couple maybe it was last week i can't even remember now they all start to blend <laughs> but um oh i understand i worked uh, i interviewed uh, dorothy fitzer and she was talking about the somatic integration of mm. life and experience and just how important the body is in terms of digesting 
thought, experience, trauma. And I think that's one of the most beautiful aspects, I think, of movement arts in general, I think, is that people, when they can get into a spot where we all know that we can go see a psychological counselor and we can talk our problems out. We know that we can do that. And then there's a completely different language, as you said, which I could not agree more with, which is getting into your body and understanding that the experiences we have end up making manifest in the tissues, right? We can have a, an emotional trauma that starts to change our posture. We can have um, a physical injury that changes how we move. And right. when we start getting into movement arts where things are complex, right? You're playing with opening tissues and opening cavities and spaces that maybe just typically don't get opened. It opens up this entire world. Um, it's just a beautiful place to be where movement can be it is medicine. Movement is therapy. Movement is, Absolutely. and like you said, yeah. di- digesting reality. Like that's, the, I think that's the coolest part for me in this stuff is like finding Bagua, Tai Chi, Xing Yi. I've always been amazed at how I can be struggling so completely with something, train the art, go through, do some form and come out noticeably better. And I haven't, yeah. and I haven't necessarily burned up a ton of energy through lifting something super heavy, but I have dynamically engaged my body and right. there is a measurable internal sensation yeah, and result measure. from just moving and practicing the art. And I think that's the piece that I'm always trying to get into people's minds is that movement is medicine. Movement can be therapy. And if we have more than one way to get into our psyche and into our problems, yeah. the, the better, I think it's like, how can, how can we approach this from a couple different angles, not just one way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's that's a very good launching off point for a lot of conversations we could have. But sure. uh, I mean, when you look at that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what comes to mind for me is think, uh, considering congruence, you know, and so w- what I'm hearing is it's like, you know, it's about making your life better. But like more than that, it's like having an aim and like life purpose and like mm-hmm. being like clear on how you want to use your heartbeats and your breaths. You know, it's like those are going, those are going to stop someday. You know? yes, they are. So, uh, you know, so um, what it is, it's like y- we spend so much time like complaining or getting distracted or indulging and like and how much of that is really congruent with what it is that we're fully on fire with, you know? Yeah. And so if we can like really get clear on our aim, then it's like, well, if I have, if I'm clear on this aim, like what are activities and what are elements and attributes and skills that go along with this? You know, this is yep. like really what just lights me up and uh, really just what I'm on fire for and really what I actually want to dedicate my time and energy and heartbeats to. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it that feeds that? Exercise feeds that. <laughs> well, look at the benefits of exercise and like yeah. one, you're, you've got longevity. Uh, one, as you get older, you'll still be able to do more, you know, that type of thing. Yep. You won't, you, you know, you'll be able to, you know, wipe your own ass. Like, you know, uh, you'll be able to, you know, go on walks with, with your grandchildren. Like that's very important. Uh, and then also just like the, the, uh, em- emotional benefits from exercise, extremely important. And then, uh, also mental, uh, as well It's like you get blood flow to the blood flow to the brain, like. You know, if you're ever having like a writer's block or any type of thing, like mm-hmm. exercise will really help to to aliven you. And so I think in regards to anything that you do, uh, you know, the the ex, uh, there should be no part of your body that's uh, anatomy, uh, physical or non-physical, that's uh, that's ne- uh, neglected. You know, like it's it's really it's really a wonderful gift that we all have and uh, we all take it for granted. And part of that's because of how we're raised and the culture that we're brought up in and sure. and the you know it's it's kind of like a governmental um uh uh a, th- a thing in terms of managing a wide population to kind of have them sleepwalking like it's just easier to <laughs> to work that yeah <laughs> and and then also to you know trick them into a type of economy that uh benefits the government so the government could do what they want to do <laughs> you <laughs> right. know so uh, right. yeah I guess you got a bunch of sleepwalkers, you know. <laughs> well, there's definitely some cool threads in here, and yeah, we uh, we, there's so many different directions we could go. And <laughs> but to keep this, you know, in in the in the thread of kind of extracting some okay. of the, the gems that you've um, that you've studied and the things that you've engaged in, 
you know, we've touched on the martial arts piece and the value of that, right? And what it and what it brings to people's lives. This 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 idea that the movement can be therapy, right? The the value of exercise, what it does for the body. We can all, yeah. for the most part, at least in theory, right, all agree that this is really important for all of us to like consider in terms of making our lifestyle better and having, like you said, I like that using your um, your breaths and your heartbeats. You know, how do you want to use yeah. them? And then, you know, in your your studies which are pretty different from what we learn at Five Branches. I know you got involved in Taoist mysticism. You got involved yeah. in sort of the, what I would call the shamanic um, realms of practice. Yeah. So can you, you know, that's a huge universe and I want to open it uh, <laughs> sparingly, but also selectively. Course, like, you course, know, like yeah. we have to like keep it on track to a degree. But yeah. when, you, when you look at this topic, right, Taoist mysticism, Okay. Um, Taoist magic, yeah. you know, what, there's different things that are, <laughs> that are tossed around, you know, in terms of terminology. But for people listening, you know, what is that stuff? Like, what is that? What, how does that work? What's, <sighs> what are some of the baseline um, ideas and concepts that could orient people to this topic? Right. And, you know, probably a better word. It's, uh, you know, I mostly in, in the beginning uh, use that word Taoist mysticism because that's mm-hmm. the word my t- uh, my teacher was using at that time. Mm-hmm. It's probably I to actually choose something different. I'll call it like a uh, like a, a, a Taoist work, actually, something mm-hmm. like that, or just conscious work in general with a Taoist language or a Taoist mythology. Like yeah. at the essence, it's like, you know, uh, a lot of the spiritual traditions are very much trying to do the same thing, you know, for the most part. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, very much like most martial arts are trying to do the same thing or, you know, most anything's trying to like do the same thing that fits into the same category. Like sure. it's just the how and the language and uh, uh, the elegance of it changes. And that's very much depending on the culture and so on. But uh, with with that, I would, I would like to, you know, refer to it more as like a conscious work. And so when we look at work, what is work? You know, it's like the, it's the uh, bringing into congruence all of you as much as possible with a particular activity. And if we look something at like ritual, like what makes a ritual powerful is how many levels of your being can you get congruent with an action. And so when we um, look at this, it's a type of actually a training, the same way you train your body. This just has to do with elements that are a little bit beyond your body and uh, utilize uh, uh, p- parts where you're awakening to different uh, energy and dif- different uh, different uh, aspects of your your lucidity and consciousness and awareness and all this type of stuff, and so what happens is like you know uh, me getting out of bed is a type of work or or uh, you know me you know journaling is a type of work. It's bringing my body into congruence. It's bringing my uh, uh, my speech, my breath, my uh, thought words into congruence. Right. It's bringing my um, uh, my visual center into congruence, right? This type of thing. And then there's more elements we can add on there. But basically, I'm getting, uh, you know, uh, if we went to Taoist approach, they would look at like the three Dantians as well. Like they would look at like your head center, your heart center, and uh, your power center, this type of thing. And uh, they're trying to get as much as you're, of yourself congruent with an action. And then what happens is uh, we have different meditations for that. You have different uh, more uh, somatic experiences for that, things that you're doing physically postures you take on like there's there's ways of utilizing uh your body and your anatomy to get you from point a to point b yeah and so when we look at that you have a particular aim and that aim has to do with you now i don't like the word enlightenment because it it implies an arrival point Mm -hmm. this type of thing uh so so what i tend to, to to look at is simply growth and uh, more just just discovery and growth really and there's a try to a kind of creative aspect there and so what happens is you see spiritual systems and then you see religious systems you know and this is something that we're all commonly uh, we can identify especially new age type of thinking that this gets thrown a lot around a lot but sometimes people don't take the time to explore it anytime you have like a religious system it tends to do with like the, uh, the adopting belief you know, and mm-hmm. it actually doesn't have to do with your current experience. And it also tends to have elements of worship. Uh, and worship does, isn't exactly work. And actually, in a type, like incense burning, it can be a type of wonderful experience. But uh, what happens is like a worship, what it does oftentimes is place power outside yourself, right? And that's not what spiritual work is about, you know. Actually, spiritual work is actually trying to get realize that the power is actually you as a source. 
-hmm. And that circumstance is not the dominant force in your life. That regardless of the circumstance, you're always the dominant source in your life. Your values and what you choose and what it is you want to create. But we all get distracted because some circumstance happens and then we have emotional uh, things come up and we have thoughts that come up. And we actually think that we are our thoughts and our emotions when we aren't. Uh, You know, one of my teachers would go, um, you know, uh, he's like, repeat after me, like, I have clothes, like, I have clothes, you know, it's like, I wear clothes, I wear clothes, I am not my clothes, I'm not my clothes, you know, it's like, I have a car, I drive a car, I am not my car, you know, it's like, and it's like, I have thoughts and emotions, you know, it's like, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Yeah. But we bite the hook every time. Oh, and so my God. Happens. Yes, we do. Yes, yeah. we do. Like, not yeah. every time. Like, but a lot the, of the time. <laughs> that, yeah. But that's that's the part about developing right. like a lucidity. Mm-hmm. And uh, specifically with the emotions, uh, then you see a lot more identification uh, as a type of processing. And so instead of actually advancing a life level, uh, you know, this type of thing, it's more like a change of the, how you talk about the story mm-hmm. it changes. It's actually not a transcendence and a utilization of the resource that's there. And so what you see is a, 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 um, individuals, the thoughts and emotions come up, and then they go to a type of re-identification of it, when actually, if you think of clearing the channels and the organs and the energy body and this type of thing, uh, and the memories that get trapped in the body, like this type of thing, uh, it's think of it as congestion, you know, yeah. in the same way that if I have clogged sinuses, you know, because I, I was uh, indulging in habits that were not congruent with my health and I got sick, you know, this type of thing or placing myself in environments and where I got sick. Yeah. Well, then there's the results from that. So I might have a clogged sinuses, you know, this type right. of thing. Right. And then when I clear my sinuses, like, oh, you know, I go. <laughs> In this type of thing. And then I, I don't save the rags or look at the snot and go, oh, you know, I'm inherently sinful. And I put them in my pocket and then I sneeze right. more in the day and I look at it more and I go, oh, this one's more green. That must mean my karma is bad or uh, God hates me right. or the astro- my astrology reading's bad, you know, like this type of thing. Yeah. Like that's that would be silly to do. Yeah. And uh, so the sensation as it leaves, your, it leaves you is uh, one of mucus. And as the, you have this energetic cluster and this, uh, this thing that's formed up from uh, thought and uh, uh, sensation and it has like a visual thing and memory to it, as it begins to leave uh, your vehicle, as it, gets, as it leaves your, your, your c- container, uh, it leaves in terms of it, – and its sensation is more around like emotion and thought like and feeling. Right. So in the same way, this one's mucus. This one's like kind of thought and emotion. Mm-hmm. So sometimes with my students, I just go, you know, when you're really going through something, just every once in a while, remind yourself and go, you know, this type of thing. Just yeah. Just, and this is, this is where, uh, you know, like I say, it's like a Taoist thing that I, I, I teach and talk on and stuff. And oftentimes we use the language and mythology and some of the cultivation methods and, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but most importantly, at the essence of it, it's work and it's getting you from point A to point B and then point B to C and D to, you know, just continues on. Yeah. And so oftentimes, it, why, why would we limit to ourselves to only things that have occurred thousands of years ago? Uh, you know, in terms of things like that, uh, because culture, that's a different culture and also times have changed and what we have reference points to is completely different. So things like looking at Einstein, for example, and, you know, uh, look, or looking at other traditions and other modern methods like Joe, uh, uh, Despianza or uh, what's his oh, name? Oh yeah. The belief, the, yeah, the belief yeah. guy. Yeah. He works with the uh, neuro, neuroplasticity a lot. He talks about that, yeah. but you see modern. Dispenza? Is that his name? Dispenza. Dispenza yeah. yeah. Dispenza. Yeah. Yeah, you see a lot of uh, things show up in the modern era that are hugely useful and actually will give context to the stuff that you read in the ancient stuff. And then you go, actually, those are bad translations because they're not relatable sometimes. So, you know, looking up, uh, yeah, like one of my uh, readings right now is uh, The Path of Least Resistance uh, by uh, Robert Fritz. And I have his other book, Your Life is Art, and uh, Napoleon Hill's another one I'm working through right now, uh, uh, Outwitting the Devil. Those are kind of like what I'm currently looking at. But uh, those actually give a lot of context on how to utilize the Taoist work. Yeah. And what you're seeing in today with Taoism is a lot of uh, uh, politics, uh, religion, Mm -hmm. 
and a political hierarchy, which is not a functional hierarchy. It has to do with who has the power and who gets who says who right. gets to say uh, who gets to tell who what to do, and the reasons why, and uh, or not the reasons why, just simply because they defined an answer or something like that, and that's not useful, right? And so what happens is a functional hierarchy is more based on guidance and function, right? It's, it's helping everyone get point A to point B. And so this is, this is instead of a power trip, it's more of built on guidance. This is what you need to do next rather than this is what tradition says. Uh, so anyhow, when I, so I, I give that context because I, I want to make sure that, you know, when people hear this type of conversation, they kind of have an idea of where I'm coming from. Yeah. And then I, I'm very much results based, you know, yeah. and I'm very much not a traditionalist, but at the same time, I am like, you know, it's like, those are very wonderful things that, uh, that we've accumulated uh, in our, in our, uh, you know, humanity's legacy and that type of thing. But at the same time, it has to do with all those things were discovered by a type of exploring and discovering, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and there's a, there's a couple <laughs> cool things in here that I think are, are you know, worth chewing on and one of them is as you were talking and I, and I realized this that you know I, I was born and raised Catholic that's what I came into the world with oh, fuck. and um, you know I'm not practicing or anything I'm technically still Catholic but I'm not a practicing right. Catholic but the thing that I always felt like that was missing was the body centered component there was sort of mm -hmm. everything about you know church everything about going and praying at church and as you say you know kind of worshiping it always felt very external. It always felt like everything was outside of me. And sure, there's, you know, reflection during the homily and these things. But I really was uh, perplexed and sort of frustrated that there was no connection to the body. And I think when I found these arts later in life, Taoism, um, even the martial arts where they were blending health and the body and the mind and all of these things together, I was... I thought, here's the missing link, that this is the part in Christianity, and maybe things were different way back when and texts were lost, I don't know. But the uh -huh. fact that they were so body-centered, I think, in, the, in blending spirituality in your body, I think, mm. was something that's really powerful. And like you said, right, engaging these systems in the end comes down to personal growth and, and, and what that looks like in terms of physical, mental, spiritual but changing these things using your body and then using these, you know, what, what, are, what I kind of call them like inner technologies, you know, these ways that right. we can get in and change how we're feeling, you know, how we're, like you, as you said before, digesting life and reality. When you, when you're bringing people into this, uh, this foyer and you're bringing them into Taoist work and you're exploring with them and you're kind of exposing them. Is there a launching point that you sort of start from? Is there an orientation or a place you begin them walking? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a big question. Uh, in a sense, it's uh, uh, with, with, the, with the two groups I got going on right now. Uh, you know, like uh, the, the thing is, it's, it, you know, they all have to start at the beginning. And what you tend to work on uh, and deepen, no matter at what stage you're, you're at, you always work on the foundation. And people always think, oh, this is the beginner stuff and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I have to kick students out sometimes because they're like, I'm more like you guys. So I got one that was really uh, identified in that type of thing. It's just like, I'm more advanced than the other students. If you're going to limit my spiritual growth, if you're, you're not listening to me, like this type of stuff. And uh, that's a type of psychosis, actually. Uh, you know, psychosis being def defined by, uh, you know, uh, 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 belief in like something that's actually fictioned or uh, by the mind or, you know, that sure. there's identification with obs some obscuration of the mind and kind of outside. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, it's like uh, uh, they don't they don't qualify for advanced work. <laughs> If, if your if your advanced works and your beginning works actually and kind of not based on the foundation, sure. and so what happens? I, I the first and foremost, you can need to get people into a place where they're recognizing themselves outside their circumstance and outside their thoughts and beliefs and this type of thing, mm -hmm. and they're getting to actually have some introspection and go like, well, aside from what the culture told me or what my parents taught me or what friend groups I belong to, it's like aside from all that, what is it that I 
value you know it's like what is it that i want to create and like who am i with this life you know this sort of thing is like really just starting there and so what happens you have to get them into a place where they're uh in a uh well this is where you can kind of have wu wei right it's like mm-hmm. non-action yep. uh sometimes i like to say non-reactivity instead mm-hmm. uh for the same reason that uh that uh, uh, non-reactivity it's it has to do with like something happens and you're not not reacting uh you know non-action sometimes people confuse that with like just not doing anything yeah just being uh, lazy yeah. and sitting, out, yeah, sitting around yeah. yeah yeah no non-reactivity right, you know it, right uh so as to, as uh you know but non-action works within the, the correct context and uh, sure. orientation but uh non-reactivity is more relatable and people can understand it better so uh, what happens is thoughts and emotions come up circumstance happens in your life in your life there's no reason there's no need to act immediately it's like what happens is you always get need to get people to a place where they consider their values and they make a conscious choice you know, so it's conscious choice, choice after deliberation, this type of thing. Uh, so what happens is if you look at uh, some of the Taoist scriptures, there's the eight major prayers in uh, Taoist uh, uh, scriptures, you know, and that type of thing. It's like one of them's uh, uh, Ying Bian Wu Ting, uh, and I, I murder the tone, so I don't speak Mandarin, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tai Chong Tai Xing, Ying Bian Wu Ting. It's one of the first prayers or incantations you learn and um it, taishong taishing it actually refers to uh, uh taishong laojun who's uh a, a considered to be like the essence and energy and consciousness in which like lao tzu and all the saints were kind of sourced from in a way but uh but it really represents like your your human potential and what you're capable of your future self and this type of thing like your higher nature in a sense it can represent that, and in this context, it, context it works this way. And uh, in the Ying Bian Wu Ting is uh, endlessly receive and transform, or to receive and transform without stop. Now, what do we have there? We have a type of uh, utilization of your it, 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 getting your body into congruence with uh, of within with noticing and then consciously uh, choosing. Maybe I could I could word that better, but uh, you know, Tai Chong Tai Ching Yimbao Wu Ting. It's like uh, it's kind of uh, in a in a religious sense, it would be placing the power outside of yourself. You know, it's like mm-hmm. oh, this great God, everything. You know, it's, but it's actually it refers more to your true nature. And then if you consider it, it's not letting anything go through your experiential matrix without you creatively involved with it and uh that type of thing you know or you without it going untransformed Mm -hmm. and what would make it go transformed it would have to do with like you coming from like essentially your future self or a higher version of yourself Mm -hmm. so something happens instead of reacting to it the way that everyone reacts to it you know it's like stop for a second it's like okay you know this is what i've normally done what I've normally done doesn't work. <laughs> I'm willing to try something different. Yeah. You know, if I was if I was the version of myself that was already beyond this, you know, if I imagine the the most amazing, radiant, compassionate version of myself. Sure. What is it that I would think about this? You know, what would I think what would I speak about this? What, what actions would I go there? And that really gets the essence of the beginning of conscious work is noticing and then not being a worldly person you know it's actually being more of a spiritual person which has to do with you coming from the inside out so mm-hmm. that's if you see like how the culture set up the culture set up to have sheeple to have people reactive and the power outside themselves yeah and agreed get dramatic and get confused and they do all these types of things and they try to find a crystal that'll change their energy to fix their life they uh not that therapy is not useful for a lot of people but they'll go like they'll try to do therapy or they'll try to get someone to exercise some spirit in their life or something like that yeah and uh they're they're being external and reactive and actually what that does is dangerous because it feeds the very identity that they need to outgrow yeah and so when we look at protection magic and this type of stuff i don't teach protect, i don't teach people to protect themselves uh if they want to protect themselves martial arts like self-defense sure like but in terms of the spiritual sense i don't really teach protection i teach being a bigger fish essentially yeah. you know uh so what happens is it's like if you're trying to protect yourself from a place of fear okay uh then what happens is, uh, well, you, you're, you're reacting to a circumstance 
and you're getting your body congruent. And what do you, what do you, and you're getting your body, your, your speech, your mind congruent with uh, upset and with that type of thing. So what are you communicating to your base? Uh, you know, you're communicating to your base that the emotions are more important than your goals mm -hmm. uh, and all sorts of stuff that uh, your brain understands that, uh, that this was interesting enough to make your body congruent with it was interesting enough to take an action on yeah. so the brain wires in such a way that it, it seeks to create more of that and seek more of that so at the very again at the very basis we have like Wu Wei and then Ying Bian Wu Ting is like the first things I kind of touch on usually yeah. is uh, getting into a place where you're coming from noticing awareness and then you're as things go through your experiential matrix to actually have some introspection and contemplation of your values and aside from the circumstance aside from any story aside from what even you your your upset or your feelings about it what is it that i actually value and then you know what's an action that can what are some actions i can i can do so just getting started there uh so you see that with uh you know uh the some of the incantations ying van wu ting and uh, that type of thing. And furthermore, if you look at some of the other Shang-Ching traditions, uh, like Mao Shan before, Mao Shan went super black magic <laughs> when it was actually more of a work school before they, the, the, the ritualist, uh, ritualistic stuff came in more from the Ling Bao tradition, which they kind of developed uh, some more rituals around and then they absorbed a lot of Buddhist teachings and then Mao Shan eventually absorbed that too. But before that, Mao Shan was much more shamanistic um, Again, sometimes these details are fuzzy because, you know, sometimes no, I, I know. Yeah, I know how it goes. But, uh, they, you know, like I might like, oh, this is really interesting. And then I do this thing for a while and then I go like, oh, yeah, what were the details on that? But uh, if you, there's there's a there's some meditations that are like uh, meditations on holding the three or something or holding uh, or meditating on the, the three or, or something like that. And what they're simply getting you to do is uh, to consider your body, your congruence, basically, getting you to consider your congruence uh, before action. So it's all built on Wu Wei mm -hmm. and noticing awareness, You uh, not reactive role participation. And so what happens is something goes through your experience matrix, you may get upset, but that's aside from the point. That's yeah. a reaction. That's just pre-programming. We want to un uninstall the pre those programs. So you notice mm -hmm. the program, go oh, out, wow, it's a virus. Time to get the antivirus. And yep. so the antivirus has to do with where you dedicate your life energy to. And uh, so the meditating on the three ones at its base uh, is the contemplation of the three mechanical centers. So you have your lower Dantian has mm -hmm. to do with the actions and affairs. You got your middle Dantian has to do more with the, the speech and the empathetic uh, and the virtue of part. And then you have the head center, which has to do more with your... Uh, uh, like your your visual thing uh, in your imagination center and uh, intent and aim and that sort of thing. So when you look at that, uh, you uh, uh, you know anything that goes through uh, your experiential matrix, whether pleasant or unpleasant, uh, there's a consideration on the the three ones. And so it's like, okay, what what is it that, that uh, you know I would consider speaking here, acting here, like you know you you but deeper than that it's where are you coming from sure. uh, yeah so and then you have other I've got, yeah I've got, I've got a I got a couple of questions and an observation um, mm -hmm. so you know when when you're talking about the the non reactivity right and and not having something come through our experience us getting upset it's interesting because you're I agree where and this is a tenant that's, that's tossed around quite a bit where they say we are not our thoughts and emotions and I've also noticed that we also become like our thoughts and emotions if, <laughs> and we, if, do. if we bite every time right if we are just constantly right. reactively angry we end up being labeled a angry person quote unquote right. so there's this weird kind of threshold there that I think we have to be you know aware of and the question I have yeah. is, is this because the choosing of our reactions or, or lack of reactions, right? Choosing where we want to put our energy, realizing that we can be upset, but then choosing, you know, what do we do with that energy? Where do we go with it? You know, I've always had this question and I've, t I've asked other people the same thing. I feel like there's a spectrum of emotions, right? Like someone cuts you off on the way to work. <laughs> you can have the reaction and be upset, but it's a reasonable thing for you to have a choice in. And then things like people lose their children. And that there isn't a lot of choosing at that level. There's just a full 
influx of an emotion, you know, an emotional, oh, an emotional response. And so I want to yeah. hear your thoughts on that. I feel like there's a level where we can choose and there's a level where it's like, phew, there's no stopping this. There's no stopping the, yeah. and what do you, how do you kind of um, navigate that terrain? Cause I think well, there's, there's a, there's a distinction, but I'm also, it's kind of fuzzy. Like what, what does that look like in, you know, the consider context? Yeah, change and flow. Okay, mm-hmm. so changes happen, but there's mm-hmm. a type of flowing. The the where the disease occurs is within a type of stagnant. Uh, when energy becomes stagnant, when your mind becomes stagnant, sure. this type of thing. Now you know little th- you know uh, like someone cuts you off in traffic. Traffic. For some people, that's a huge thing. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, or uh, you know, uh, like a heartbreak, like a breakup or a divorce. Right. Right. Huge thing. But with that, like people will still move on. They Some do. people don't. Yes. And because the, what happens is they're not looking to what ne- what's next and who mm-hmm. are they going to be after this or like what what is it that they want to be? And even in the the, the unfortunate uh, circumstance that someone loses a child, you know, very sad. Yeah. And you know, it's very strong. You know, mourning and loss and this type of thing. Mm-hmm. But as time goes forward, you know, you eventually will move move on in a sense and you'll yep. still cherish all those memories and yep. those memories may even be like a resource for you they be they mm-hmm. may even be an energy boost for you in terms of what motivates you and it, maybe those experiences helped you reflect on in your life what's most important to you you know yeah. contemplate like impermanence and you know maybe you know like there's people that have a uh, you know, have have had the uncer- uh, unfortunate circumstance of you know being violated sexually and rape sure. and that sort of thing, but sometimes people will heal from that, and then they they feel a deep passion to to helping people heal through their journeys and that type of thing, and they Absolutely. find a, a life purpose, you know, and so in regards to this, the the you have to look at what harms the body, you know. Mm-hmm. What destroys the body? What destroys the psyche? What dims that person's light? Mm-hmm. And so you can always see that when it shows up with the uh, identifications around the emotions and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And those are bound to happen as we go through life change. Yeah. Things get shooken up. There's nothing in life that, uh, as as far as I mean, uh, organisms go. You know, like for us especially, is like growth spurts. Like those can be painful. So, uh, or you know, there's a type of pressure when a seed's cracking, or when a plant's cracking out of a seed, and before it reaches uh, above the earth, like it's a, in a type of pressure and it's meeting resistance. But it's part of its growth, you know. Any time when our our muscles build based off like damaging them and the you know the whole, whole lactic acid thing yep. and then repairing them, they come back stronger. So in a sense, like every experience, you want to utilize it. You want to turn it from lead into gold. And the spiritual work's all about turning your lead into gold, like, you know. So it's like that's the lead of your life or that type yep. of thing. Yep. You know, and it could be very hard, but it can also be utilized. And yep. so this is the difference where you get someone where circumstance is the dominant force in their life, where it's right. all about what happens to them. And and then uh, and then you have an uh, you know, individual that's like, you know, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. This is a big change. Like, this is really hard for me, you know, but it doesn't stop them from dreaming a positive reality. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. stop them from creating the next step of their life. What's right. Next? That's most right. Well, and, you know, one of the, th- the threads I've seen with people that I've worked with and people who have gone through really intense traumas and they've had really brutal um, yeah. experiences, you know, one of the things that's pretty consistent that I've seen is that people also they have to fully experience the thing that has happened to them. They have to fully sort of surrender to the pain and and let it in essentially fully because I feel like what I've seen is the people that don't fully let it in. They don't let themselves be saturated by the grief, right? By the loss of the child. It's when they start to put walls up and say, I can't feel this. That seems to be part of where the stagnation begins and people will actually get stuck. So there's this weird you know, sort of bitter pill to life in a sense where we, the suffering has to pass through us in a sense, it seems like. And then Feel it once it goes through, the damage has been done and that's when the repair and the growth and the movement can happen. But it's a really, it's a hard thing to see because I, I've, I've seen people, like you said, you know, they just, they have something happen and they get stuck. They get and, locked. Into yeah, yeah. And they get, and they get sick later. And, you know, it's never 
when I see that, it's never like, oh, they've done it wrong. I just think, God, that's unfortunate. And I understand also, you know, like life is yeah. incredibly brutal when people get stuck. Um, you know, it's not something to be ashamed of, but it does happen. Like you do. Oh, see, it happens all the time. Yeah. And that's people part of our stuck. growth. Yeah. It's like recognizing where we have made the unconscious decision to get stuck, mm -hmm. you know, and that's ultimately what it is. It's like, you know, I got stuck. It's like, you know, like I, I kind of put myself there actually, you know, and it's like, how did I put myself there? And, yeah. uh, you know, that type of thing. But what's more important is we always thrive best when we're in a type of creative orientation. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're orientating uh, and, and, and actually directing our lives and, and taking some deliberate action. Now, the, the, other, the other part about that is like, yeah, when something happens, it's like uh, you do have people that go into a denial system. You know, yeah. like what I'm, what I'm talking about is not a denial system. Right. Uh, it actually <clears throat> implies, uh, I mean, actually, if you're moving towards be, being more fully al alive, you may actually feel it more, perhaps, you know. Sure. Because there's you have le less buffer systems, you know, it actually you kind of meet it, and uh, but the thing is like it's it's like a unclogged faucet, it it, it flows through, it passes through, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if you're uh, uh, if you're looking at you know, feeling that also completion, some things around the the emotions, how they get trapped in the body is one like you you suppress them. And you deny them, like just like no, this could not be true. Like you know, it's like how could this ever happen to me? Yeah. Like this type of thing, or just like you know, I refuse to believe that you know this. Like pe people will say weird things like this, and then yeah. uh, other things, people distract themselves, like alcohol, you know, uh, yeah. TV, sex, uh, yeah. all sex, uh, yep. all sorts of distractions, you know, food, uh, that type of thing, and uh, exercise even. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes people want to uh, just. Uh, uh, you know, they get they get hyper identified with something else as a way of just avoiding the other thing altogether. You know, it's like you know, some people can even get into like uh, spiritual mumbo jumbo type stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and just like you know uh, that type of thing. So, uh, and then other other things is people keep it inside themselves uh, through word vomiting, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is, uh, which could be one of the the more dangerous ones because what happens is if you can get other people to validate your experience. Then what happens? Oh, it must be true, or I must be right. This yeah. type of thing. So, and it's incredibly dangerous because now you have a network, or you, you have the the sensation that you know you're va you're valid in your upset. Uh, so that one could be actually more dangerous. Is uh, yeah. telling you know convincing everyone that uh, so and so is the bad guy, you're the good guy. This type of thing that you were a victim, they were a villain, or something like that, or, yeah. or you're the hero and the other people, and there's a victim and villain stance or something. So, uh, so when you word vomit in that way, what happens is you're constantly retelling the story, and you're kind of feeding the story, and you're keeping it around. Your ba your brain's recognizing that you really value the story because you keep on telling it, and so it creates neural pathways to continue you firing that story through your mind and what do we know about neuroplasticity one it's like it not only does it transfer data from point a to point b faster but also it the the, they, the pathways increase it goes from like a two-lane highway to like a six-lane highway right. more data can move faster mm -hmm. so uh uh so what happens is then it's like your 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 brain will randomly fire those signals throughout the day. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's like a, you know, what part of a computer doesn't have electricity flowing through it? Like it's it's you know, it's like the kind of like if the, those neural pathways are down, information's going to fire along those. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. So uh, what happens is like this is why when it comes to uh, spiritual work, some other key components are surrender yeah. and uh, and forgiveness. But mm -hmm. even more, gratitude. Forgiveness implies something around the past, and it can be helpful, you know, to have to have, do that conscious decision to forgive something. Mm -hmm. But true forgiveness is going leads to gratitude. So even for the perpetrator and that type of thing, you know, the whole experience, although very unpleasant, you become incredibly grateful because you can start to extract value out of the experience. You can start tread, turning the lead into gold. And so you go like, yeah, it sucks. And I wouldn't want that for me again. But right. it's actually supplied me with like the experience and wisdom on how to better navigate my life and actually how to be more creative. So that's, um, I mean, right on. And I, I agree. And that's, you know, the, the, the old adage that heroes are, are not born, they're made. <laughs> they need yeah, to yeah. go through the, the the hurdles, right? We have to go through oh, these yeah. pretty 
shitty situation sometimes to, like you said, extract that alchemical process, right? Take something and convert it into something right. val valuable and really important. And it's a pretty consistent thread, I think, through a lot of um, a lot of different you know ways of being in different traditions. They kind of, like you said, they're all kind of working towards the same goal, right? Like how do you how do you extract yeah. the gem out of the things that are difficult and trying and that um, can definitely destabilize you. Like there's there's no getting around that these things yeah. will have a hugely destabilizing impact on people's lives. But I think that's what's great about your the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think just with the healing field in general is when we're looking at this is that people have the tools and the the means and the different avenues to actually go through this stuff. It's not just one way. You know, there's lots of different flavors to try oh, yeah. to get to, to to get through your process. You know, which I think is is yeah. really cool. Well. Kelly, if we're like, you know, we circled around in this conversation, we've gone from like the martial arts, we've talked about some of the Taoist mysticism, and yeah. sort of in kind of like, you know, encapsulating this and kind of wrapping things up in a way. Um, you know, I know you're doing, um, you said you have a couple online programs, right? You're doing the, the Bagua. Uh, yeah, most, yeah, the the main thing that's open right now is Bagua Online, uh, okay, which, Bagua is online. Like a, which is like, which is baguaonline.com. Uh but it basically what it is subscription model the uh, step by step bring you through learning bagua going through you know posture the quality of the muscle what you're looking for exercises that go along with it mm -hmm. and step by step so it's very comprehensive i talk a lot uh so it's it's good for people that actually want the detail if they're looking to get a form as quickly as possible or something like that and do it incorrectly there's tons of dvds out there for that sure uh, i'm not one of the, i'm not the same i'm not that individual i'm for there for people that actually uh want to take the time to s drill something in step by step and uh that's the program that i've opened the dao stuff is not open it's not public uh those are closed classes uh, mainly because they follow a type of curriculum and bringing yeah. new people in constantly with that course could actually kind of make it the whole learning structure uh, a, little, uh, a little incongruent. So the integrity is built around uh, starting a class, closing the class, and then going on a journey together. Uh, so those close classes are close to the public, and there will be training opportunities. Sure. And, all but, sorts of things in the future. But if people wanted to like find you and, and potentially be a part of the Bagua online, they can they can go on to baguaonline.com and find some of your content. Yeah. Yeah, baguaonline.com or www.daoist.academy and uh, not a dot com. And for some browsers, you need to put the www. And, uh, okay. you know, and these days, I actually wish I chose something else. But <laughs> yeah. uh, D-A-O, not with a T, uh -huh. with a T. A D, D as in dog. Mm -hmm. uh, so www.daoist.academy. And uh, if you go there, uh, there should be some sort of place to like fill in your email and join a mailing list. And if there's any training opportunities, you'll likely find out about them that way. Uh, the way I'm gearing things right now is to put a lot more energy into Bagua online mm -hmm. and uh, planning uh, seminars uh, around you know United States and Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, that that's the that's the current. Uh, uh, work mode right there. The current and, direction. Uh, that's great. Yeah, man. that's the current direction, and uh, we'll see what shows up uh, in the future. There's other things that I really love doing. Like I really love, uh, like helping people with the business, uh, uh, and not the not the back end paperwork stuff. I hate that stuff <laughs> uh, for myself. I'm, I'm more like helping people to develop like a really fun sure. uh, product, and then how to market it. I really love the marketing part. That's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, I really love that. And uh, uh, the first is like really fun. And then like the whole strategy aspect of how to put it out, like all that back end work I really love and I like to help people with. But I don't know if that's ever going to be a business thing. That might just be a fun thing. Sure. Uh, and if, uh, if people if people want to find you on social media, like do you have a do you oh, have any spaces? Yeah. Where, where, where should they go? Or do you do that? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I would search uh, Daoist Lake, uh, D-A-O-I-S-T-L-A-K-E. You can find some stuff on Instagram and you can find some stuff uh, maybe okay. on Facebook. Uh, that's It's been pretty dormant lately. Yeah. So, uh, but you can still find me and contact me uh, that way. Uh, I always like to give the people, the listeners, just a couple different avenues if they want to like, <clears throat> you know, depending on who has what interface and whatnot, I think it's just good to give people variety to find access to you, which I think is, you know, which is good. Um, yeah. well in this Kelly, I always ask this of my guests, you know, if, um, you know, what's your invitation to people in this larger context of, 
you know, Taoist mysticism, martial arts, these ways of being, if you were to sort of, you know, wrap things up in, in, a, in a quick little elevator speech, what would be your invitation to the person who's entering into this stuff and looking for, um, you know, growth, uh, growth in their life and they're looking for, you know, healing and movement, forward movement? What would be oh, your, what would be your, your elevator? Develop, invite? Yeah, develop an aim and a resolve. Uh, so the, cause you could, we had, we could have many different aims. Like our intent can change older, you know, sometimes you have people that are all over the place. It's like, what are they doing mm -hmm. these days? Like, I have no idea they're doing this. Now they're doing this. Like, I don't know what's going on in their life. Ask them, you know, that type of thing. Like develop a strong aim in your life of like the highest version of, of yourself uh, possible, what you can imagine yourself uh, as, you know, and then consider what it is that that version of yourself is doing in their daily experience. What is they're thinking in their daily experience uh what is it that they tend to hold in their mind in terms of visualize where they place their attention no different than placing a cup on a table like you place your attention and so and considering all of that uh come from that you know as much as possible so what would that version of myself do you know that type of thing mm -hmm. and what happens is that's going to help you better utilize your experience and it's going to help you better utilize whatever craft it is that you're working on so if i'm doing martial arts for example by joining like a jujitsu gym mm -hmm. i have a strong vision of myself which helps me to better focus on certain things that you know and help me to help me in my learning process and so on and then the other part is uh uh resolve uh to, to develop a type of a t a tenacity and a commitment so what I like to say around resolve is a will beyond circumstance, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's like circumstance can happen, but it's a will beyond circumstance. And the other thing about that type of uh, resolve uh, and tenacity is like a, uh, there's, type, there's a type of a heroism that goes along with that. You know, in the same way that we talked about like the hero's journey earlier, mm -hmm. that there's obstacles will happen. You know, that's part of your hero's journey. Make it fun, make it creative, make it part of your your super story, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, the the other thing is ask as many questions as possible because I don't care what the craft is or what the language is. What I care most about is helping people to navigate uh, their life and then source what it is that they actually have inside and share that with the world and develop that and um, uh, Ask as many questions as possible, you know t Talking does not is not a sign of intelligence, you know being articulate to me is not a sign of intelligence asking questions is uh, You know like Leonardo da Vinci used to like write down like a hundred questions a day yeah. uh, You know, it's like that type of thing. So it's like, you know, how could I do this better? And then also things in terms of your just daily experience where you could get instant uh, satisfaction like you know it's like how joyful can I be right now how much more joyful can I be right now you put your monkey mind on search mode you're, you're like yes, right. uh, you give know it, this type give of give it thing. some jobs <laughs> yeah give it some jobs you know utilize yeah. it so uh, you know it's like uh, and then uh, and then surround yourself with a few objects that kind of that that are reminders for that you know so if like you have like a uh, uh, you know, a, a special uh, sh a shirt that you like wear when you, uh, 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 you know, you want to be productive, you know, sure. it's like, it's like kind of turning into the super version of yourself, you know, and that's yeah. really going to help people just utilize their experience. And it just takes resolve and attention as much as possible throughout the day. And uh, you can really, if, if and any time lies come up, you know, it's like, oh, this isn't working, you know, uh, 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 86 them, uh, you know, kick, <laughs> yeah. kick them out. They, those aren't you. Time those, to are go, right. those are just thoughts. Those are bound to come up and expect that they're about, they're bound to come up. That's a type of spiritual warriorship is knowing that you will encounter, uh, uh, uh you know, that type of thing and knowing who your enemy is. Yep. Uh, so, uh, there was some quote by some musician. I forget. He's not, I don't, I don't know if he's don't remember what genre or something like that. I just remember it was a very inspiring quote. Just imagine the best version of you possible, highest version of yourself possible, most compassionate, most resourceful, mm -hmm. most powerful. And then anything else is a lie. And yeah. it's very that much that simple. So whenever you, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful, I'll keep, man. I keep on going. Of so course. Yeah, you we, You're doing a good job at directing me. <laughs> no, yes. man, I, I appreciate it. And um, yeah. I love the work you're doing. Keep it up you know, keep doing what you're doing. Just keep, keep throwing down the medicine as you understand it and you experience it because that's the piece that I really like about um, Chinese medicine, the guests I have and people that aren't even in the Chinese medicine field who I get on here, who are just, you know, contributing 
to life and making things better. And I think that's the game and you're doing it. So I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll see. I'll take uh, care. You, All right. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye.